Welcome to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel and our anesthesiology keyword review. The topic today is aging and anesthesia. Looking at the keywords for over more than a decade on the topic aging physiology and pharmacology, you can see that cardiovascular physiology and aging, autonomic physiology, respiratory physiology and aging, and pharmacology and aging were the major subheadings. Under cardiovascular physiology, things like the physiologic changes that occur with aging, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, changes in systemic vascular resistance. Under autonomics, changes in autonomic function and baroreceptors and the central nervous system, the effect of aging on volatile anesthetics and what they do to the electroencephalogram. And under the respiratory system, pulmonary physiologic changes, hypoxemia, closing capacity and the changes in FRC, normal arterial oxygenization with aging. And under pharmacology, we have things like dosing of opioids, dosing of muscle relaxants, induction agents, MAC reduction in the elderly, and general differences in dosing of all of our drugs in the geriatric patients. So let's move on to our first keyword, which is cardiovascular changes, specifically focusing on the beta receptor. Up at the top right, you can see a sympathetic nerve releasing norepinephrine and the beta-1 receptor being one of its targets. The beta-1 receptor on the heart, when it's stimulated either by the sympathetic nerves or by exogenous or endogenous catecholamines, results in chronotropy, which is an increase in heart rate, dromotropy, which is increased speed of conduction through, for example, the AV node, inotropy, better squeeze, and even lusotropy, better relaxation. In the elderly patient, there is a decrease in response to beta receptor stimulation. There is not a decrease in actual numbers of beta receptors. It appears to be an intracellular coupling problem. So it's a response, not a number change, and the response is less to both endogenous, the release from our own sympathetic nerves and from our adrenal, as well as exogenous, intravenously, centrally mediated catecholamines. So clinically, there is an increased circulating norepinephrine in these patients. It's like their body is turning up the gain. They realize that the beta receptor is not responding as well, so let's just turn up and produce more norepinephrine. And so elderly patients tend to have more circulating norepinephrine if you measured it. When increased myocardial flow demand is present, for example, during a surgery and stress, they can't increase their heart rate as much, they can't squeeze their veins as much, and they can't raise their systolic blood pressure as much as a younger person. Their response to stress is reduced, but at resting levels, cardiac output, ejection fraction, tend to be preserved in a healthy elderly patient. So it's only under stress where we uncover some of these changes like a decrease in maximal heart rate. They can't increase their heart rate as much as a younger person. In fact, 220 minus your age is an estimate of your maximal heart rate. Mine would be about 160. And when I ride my bike now, when I used to be able to get up over 200 heart rate, now I can only get up into the 170s no matter how, how hard I pedal. So maximal heart rate decreases with age. Decreased peak ejection fraction goes down and they tend to meet demand, cardiac output demand, by increasing preload reserve. That is, they operate from a more of a preload. The heart has to respond to volume and use the Frank, Frank Starling mechanism, that is, rather than uh, increasing inotropy as much and chronotropy as much as a younger person would do. And this makes the heart more susceptible to cardiac failure because it's operating at a higher volume. The next key word is cardiovascular change is stiffening, and stiffening occurs in the arteries, the veins, and the myocardium. In the arteries, it's evidenced by systolic hypertension. Frequently, we see isolated systolic hypertension in the elderly, a blood pressure of 180 over 90, for example. But they also have ineffective maintenance of preload because the veins are a reservoir for blood and can buffer changes in blood volume. And if they're stiff, and can't dilate and constrict as well, they're not as good of a reservoir for that blood. And if someone became hypovolemic, normally you would have a constriction of the veins to increase preload to the heart. Elderly just can't do that as well. They have increased pulse pressure frequently with a high systolic blood pressure. 
uh, wide away from the diastolic blood pressure, that classic 180 over 90 in the isolated systolic hypertension, and their systemic vascular resistance tends to be increased. And as the left ventricle works against this increased resistance, it often hypertrophies. And we see LV hypertrophy in the elderly patient, especially if they've had longstanding hypertension. Now the myocardium gets stiff also, the connective tissue uh, in the cells, in between the cells, hypertrophy of the muscle, and the wall gets stiff, diastolic function uh, is reduced, it just doesn't relax as well, but in the healthy aging heart, ejection fraction, stroke volume, and cardiac output at rest are preserved. It's under stress conditions where they just cannot increase those as much as a younger person could. Diastolic dysfunction in the aging patient is the next keyword, and let's look at the graphic at the top right first, which shows LV pressure on the y-axis and LV volume on the x-axis, a classic pressure volume curve. And the one with systolic dysfunction is shown first, where the reddish pink pressure volume curve shows that it's shifted to the right, that is, it's operating from a higher volume. The heart that's failing is often dilated and big. And the width of it reflects the stroke volume or ejection fraction, and a systolic dysfunction has reduced ejection fraction, often reduced stroke volume. And an important point is the end diastolic pressure. Here is end diastole, and if we trace it over to the LV pressure, it is increased. So the pressure inside the heart at end diastole is high and puts these patients at risk for pulmonary edema, for example. Now if we look at the graphic on the far right, which shows diastolic dysfunction, the graph in reddish pink is not shifted to the right. In fact, the volume is either about the same as normal or even a little bit less. The left ventricle is often thick and takes up some of that um, uh, fluid space inside the left ventricle, and so it often is considered to operate from a little bit lower volume. But look at, at end diastole. Again, the pressure is high, it's just not relaxing. And if the pressure is high at end diastole, that can back up into the lung and result in pulmonary edema. And you can see why the uh, threshold for fluid administration in the elderly is very narrow for safety because if you pour in too much, the pressure goes up dramatically. If you pour in too little, um, they're gonna be hypotensive. The elderly are very dependent on atrial kick for filling of the left ventricle. Normally we say about 25 to 30 percent of the left ventricle is filled by the atrial kick. Passive filling fills it most of it, but in the elderly this may go up into the 50 or 60 percent or even more. And so if an elderly patient suddenly goes into atrial fibrillation, for example, you could see how atrial fibrillation uh, conversion from normal sinus rhythm and losing that atrial kick could make them hypotensive. They need time for filling and tachycardia is really poorly tolerated in the elderly patient. As they speed up and have less time for filling of the left ventricle, they are going to get hypotensive. And if you give a lots of fluid in the perioperative period, you could see how excessive administration could precipitate heart failure in these patients that are already operating at pretty high pressures inside the left ventricle. The left ventricular end diastolic pressure is higher for the same volume as compared with a normal heart. And one way we look at diastolic function is the filling patterns of the left ventricle on echo. If you put a Doppler across the mitral valve and look at the filling pattern at the mitral valve tips of the leaflets, you can see that initially there is what is inscribed as an E wave, which is passive filling of the left ventricle. And if they're in sinus rhythm, the atrial kick follows with the uh, velocity of flow inscribing an A wave. And normally that E wave is higher than the A wave and it often reverses in the elderly. And it's just one thing we look at to uh, diagnose diastolic dysfunction. The next key word is autonomic nervous system changes in the elderly. And in general, we think of the elderly patients as being highly sympathetic toned as opposed to, let's say, infants who have high parasympathetic tone. So increasing sympathetic tone as you age, and again, it's like the receptors, the beta receptors are not working quite as well, and so the body turns up the gain by increasing more norepinephrine. And if you measured norepinephrine in the blood of an elderly patient versus a younger patient, in general, it would be higher. There's no change in the alpha or muscarinic receptor activity. 
And the beta receptor number, remember, is not decreased, but the function is. The baroreceptors receptors themselves are not as responsive, and many of you probably have seen your grandma or grandpa getting up slowly from a chair or from a bed, because if they get up rapidly, they're not able to constrict their blood vessels or increase their heart rate as fast to compensate for that orthostatic hypotension that can ensue. So in the graphic on the far right, let's look at end organ responsiveness, which is decreased first. Their epinephrine levels, norepinephrine levels go up. Their beta agonist action is not as great, so they're not gonna get as fast a heart rate or as good a contraction or as good a vascular relaxation or constriction in general as a younger person. And on the far right, they have an increased threshold for activation of afferent input such that their baroreceptors are not as responsive. So they're not going to vasoconstrict as well when they're cold. And they're not going to have as much beat-to-beat -beat heart rate changes with changes in blood pressure. So baroreceptors uh, are affected. They're decreased in their responsiveness. And there is increased sympathetic tone in the elderly. You can imagine that they're going to have wider swings in hemodynamics in the perioperative period. You're not going to get those train tracking blood pressure um, uh, recordings in your record. They're less effective in maintaining constant organ perfusion, for example, to their heart, kidneys, and uh, brain. And they're more susceptible to intraoperative and postoperative hypothermia. The next key word is cardiovascular changes conduction system now, and the pacemaker loses cells as we age. The SA node, AV node, and conduction bundles become infiltrated with fibrous and fatty tissue. If there's infiltration of this abnormal tissue in the uh, generating and conduction fibers of the system of the heart associated with electrical conduction, you can imagine then why sick sinus syndrome may ensue, or the SA node's just not working very well, Right bundle branch block, not that uncommon in the elderly. Atrial fibrillation, um, and atrial fibrillation is also facilitated by the frequent occurrence of left atrial enlargement secondary to diastolic dysfunction and relaxation problems. Higher pressures in the left ventricle backs up into the left atrium and the left atrium dilates. So the elderly patient is frequently in atrial fibrillation. Left bundle branch block should not be considered normal aging if it uh, is present and is a change from its absence earlier. You should investigate the uh, possibility of myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction. CNS aging is the next key word. We touched on autonomic dysfunction and the impaired baroreceptor function that's present, that they're going to have instability of blood pressure, harder to control it. Um, temperature regulation issues because they can't vasoconstrict as well. They also have decreased brain mass and their cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolism or need for oxygen is reduced. But their autoregulation is intact such that if uh, metabolism goes up or the need for uh, oxygen goes up, let's say their temperature goes up from 35 up to 37 degrees, that increases cerebral metabolic rate. Well, their blood flow is going to go up. That's called the blood flow metabolism autoregulation or linking. Pressure flow autoregulation is also intact such that over a very wide range of mean arterial pressure or cerebral perfusion pressure more specifically, they maintain the cere same cerebral blood flow. However, if they have long-standing hypertension, you can imagine that that pressure flow autoregulatory curve could be shifted to the right and require higher blood pressures uh, to maintain adequate uh, blood flow to their brain. And their CO2 responsiveness, that is, as the CO2 goes up, blood flow goes up to their head, this autoregulation is intact in the elderly. There are neurotransmitters that are decreased, including serotonin, dopamine, and acetylcholine, and aged patients tend to be more sensitive to most of our anesthetics. And to the volatile anesthetics, there's decreased MAC of about 6% for every decade after age 40. The same concentration of inhaled anesthetic, let's say one mac of isoflurane, 1.2%, will have a greater effect on EEG than in a younger patient. That is, if you're monitoring the EEG in an elderly patient and gave them 1.2% isoflurane and had a younger patient next to them on 1.2% isoflurane, the elderly patient's going to have lower power to their EEG, lower frequency, more towards the delta waves and theta waves lower BIS numbers, 
and greater percent burst suppression ratio at high doses of the volatile anesthetic. Let's go to uh, CNS aging in the brain and specifically focusing in now on pain perception, thermal regulation, and what happens with neuraxial blocks. Pain perception is decreased um, significantly in the elderly and we should decrease our dose of opioids by about in half or 50%. They also have impaired thermal regulation, the ability to maintain their temperature at a steady state and they're going to have greater variability in the perioperative period in their core temperature. There's a risk of hypothermia getting cold because they just can't vasoconstrict as well in response to cold and we know that vasoconstriction is one of the major ways that we reduce our loss of heat from our body. Shivering is another thing that we can do to raise our temperature, but if you're anesthetized and with neuromuscular blockade, obviously you cannot shiver. There's also a risk of hyperthermia in the elderly. They can't sweat as well. Their threshold for sweating is increased. So both being very hot and very cold is a risk in the perioperative period more for an elderly patient than in a younger patient. Regarding neuraxial blocks, epidural, when you inject a local anesthetic, if you give for example, 20 mils to an elderly patient versus 20 mils of local to a younger patient. It tends to spread more dermatomally in that elderly patient. And for spinal, if you inject your spinal local anesthetic, it tends to last longer for the same dose uh, in that elderly patient. There's problems with postoperative dysfunction in the elderly, and that's the next key word, defining the difference between cognitive dysfunction and delirium. Postoperative cognitive dysfunction, or POCD, refers to a persistent deterioration in mental performance when you do cognitive testing on that elderly patients in the postoperative period. And the risk is age, which is the number one predictor, very complicated and long operations, complications after surgery like infections and respiratory complications, cardiac surgery in general, orthopedic surgery, pain issue problems postoperatively, and if they already had some cognitive impairment before surgery. Postoperative delirium is an acute transient as opposed to persistent and fluctuating disturbance of consciousness, and it's a clinical diagnosis. Note that postoperative cognitive dysfunction was a cognitive test measurement. Postoperative delirium is a clinical diagnosis, often presenting on postoperative day one to three and usually resolves in hours to days and often presents as agitation in the elderly or sundowning uh, in the nighttime period. The next key word is respiratory system and aging. What happens to the lung when someone ages? I like to think of the lung as sagging, just like everything else when you age. It is, loses its ability after it's inflated to go back to a small size with so a decrease in lung elastic recoil. Because it doesn't recoil as much, it has a higher functional residual capacity, like a patient with COPD and emphysema does. And their lung is more compliant, it's like easier to get air into it. There is a loss of alveolar units, and this is associated with a decrease in oxygen diffusing capacity if you measure DLCO. The PaO2 from an arterial blood gas you expect to be decreased in an elderly patient. And there is an equation that's as follows, 109 minus 0.4 times your age. And that is an estimate of what a normal P laleo 2 would be based upon its decrement related to aging. The increased closing volume with premature airway closure that occurs in the elderly causes VQ mismatch. And there's also an increased AA gradient contributing to this normal decreased P laleo 2 that we see in the elderly. There may be a left shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve with a decreased P50. And I only mention this because there was a key word from the ABA ITE keywords in the past years. There's small airway closure and some gas trapping and there's increased residual volume. And there's some decrease in expiratory flow rates. Let's look at the graphic on the right to summarize some of these changes. First of all, you can see that lung volume is on the y-axis and age is on the x-axis. And as we age, residual volume, as pointed out by the blue arrow, is increasing. That's the gas that's trapped in your lung that you cannot get out no matter how hard you try and is not measured by spirometry but requires special pulmonary function testing to be able to measure that. 
FRC includes expiratory reserve volume plus residual volume. And since residual volume is going up, FRC is going up also. And you can see that it crosses at about age 66 here, um, where FRC is crossing over closing volume. And you can see why if your tidal volume is below closing volume, how you can get VQ mismatching and a decrease in P little a02. Total lung capacity in general does not increase, but the FRC and residual volume does. Some summary things about the respiratory system in aging. The lung parenchyma, we know there's VQ mismatch and closing capacity goes up and PaO2 goes down and they get these emphysema-like changes uh, with loss of elastic recoil of the lung. Ventilatory control, there tends to be a decreased responsiveness to increases in CO2. So for the same amount and increase in carbon dioxide, they will not hyperventilate as much. And they don't have as good of hyperventilatory response to hypoxia and hypotension either. The chest wall tends to be less compliant because they get arthritic changes and uh, cartilaginous changes. And the muscle strength, they lose muscle strength. And so the ability to move your lungs in and out is reduced. Conducting airways, there's minimal changes, but airway reflexes are decreased such that when you do direct laryngoscopy in an elderly patient, I know I have frequently seen pieces of food particles around their glottic opening, and I'm thinking, they didn't eat for over eight hours. How did that just stay there and it not bother them? And then I remembered, okay, their airway reflexes are decreased. Maybe that's the reason. Kidneys next. What happens in the kidneys in an elderly patient? They get a decrease in number of glomeruli, a decrease in length and volume of the tubules, and their GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, goes down and their tubular function goes down. And the Cockroft-Galt equation is a way to estimate preoperatively what the creatinine clearance is of someone based upon their age, their weight, and their serum creatinine, which is 140 minus their age, times their weight in kilograms over 72 times their serum creatinine. So age is part of the uh, Cockroft-Galt equation. And as age goes up, you can see that the numerator, 140 minus age, is going to become less, and therefore creatinine clearance goes down with age. The kidney can't concentrate and dilute as well. It can't handle sodium and potassium or acid as well. So some of the implications of renal changes with aging, one, they have less ability to respond to physiologic stresses, and this can predispose them to pre-renal azotemia, hyperkalemia, dilutional hyponatremia. They can't clear some of our drugs as well, and they may last longer. The serum creatinine in the elderly, if you look at that preoperatively, if it's up, this implies a greater decrement in renal function than in the young. Why is that? Well, you lose muscle as you age and you're not producing as much creatinine. So if your creatinine was one and a half, for example, in a 75 year old, very small, you know, 100 pound elderly female, you'd say, wow, 1.5, that's a lot of creatinine. And when you put it into your Cockroft-Galt equation or age in the creatinine, you can see there's a decrement in creatinine clearance. So little elevations above normal in the elderly that aren't making a lot of creatinine should imply that there is a, uh, a renal insufficiency present. Decreased diluting ability, their greater urine volume necessary to excrete an obligatory solute load. So the kidneys are just not working well as well. Their GFR goes down and they can't deal with the sodium potassium acid changes as well that can occur in the perioperative period. The next key word is pharmacologic changes with aging. The body changes in general. We tend to lose the muscle, the lean body mass, increase the amount of fat, and decrease the total body water, which in a normal uh, person is somewhere around about 60 to 70 percent or so body water. But as we age, and aged females especially, lose a total body water percent, which may be down in the 55% range or so for an aged female. And this is going to change the volume of distribution of our drugs, especially those that go into the water space because of the decrease in total body water, and into the fat space because there's increased fat. There may be alterations in the ability of the liver and the kidney to clear our drugs. They tend to be more sensitive to anesthetic agents. That's a pharmacodynamic effect and their hemodynamic responses to the drugs may be ex uh, exaggerated. For example, when you give propofol, which vasodilates, which cardiodepresses, and is one 
uniquely induction agent that blocks the baroreceptors so that you don't get nearly as much reflex tachycardia as you would with some of our other induction agents, you can see why an elderly patient could get very hypotensive to a usual and standard induction dose of propofol. Comparing pharmacodynamics versus pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics refers to um, the sensitivity of the brain to a drug. This is what we're focusing on right now anyway, the brain. So let's look at some of our drugs that result in increased cerebral sensitivity as we age. And propofol, opioids, benzodiazepines, we know the MAC goes down as we age, all of those, the brain is more sensitive. As opposed to barbiturates, thiopental was a classic uh, ITE keyword. We rarely use thiopental or brevitol anymore, but there was no evidence of increased organ sensitivity to the barbiturate thiopental. Actually, the central volume of distribution is decreased in the elderly, and you just get kind of more bang for the buck. I like to think of it as going to the brain, staying there for longer, and staying there in increased uh, concentrations, rather than the brain itself being more sensitive to it. Now, the brain is also not more sensitive to automatate, it appears, and the body is not more sensitive to neuromuscular blocking agents, the muscles in the body. So pharmacodynamics refers to how a drug acts on the body, kinetics, how it gets in and out of the body. And let's look at some uh, dosing of anesthetic agents in the elderly and some of the changes that we probably should make. For inhaled volatile anesthetics, we know that the MAC decreases about 6% per decade after age 40. Induction agents, we should decrease the dose somewhere between about 15 to 50%. Midazolam, whether we should give a benzodiazepine or not to an elderly, we can debate. Uh, but if you choose to give one, you should greatly reduce the dose, probably by 75% or so. In opioids in general, we give about half the dose, reducing it 50%, and this includes remifentanil. Neuroblastic blocking agents are different. We should give the same dose if we want the same effect. There's no change in pharmacodynamics. In other words, the muscle is not responding differently to that neuromuscular blocking agent in the young or the elderly. But you gotta remember, after you give that drug and it has its effect, the liver and the kidneys may be involved in clearance of the neuromuscular blocking agent and the liver and the kidneys in the elderly may not clear it as well. There's no change in cystatricurium, that neuromuscular blocking agent that breaks down spontaneously in the body at normal temperature and pH, and there's no change in its clearance in that elderly patient. Opioids in aging, there is an age-related decrease in pain perception, and there's an increased sensitivity to opioids. This includes morphine, sufentanil, fentanyl, remifentanil, and therefore the recommendation that we previously made of decreasing the dose of opioids by about 50%. The clearance of remifentanil and morphine uh, and others are decreased. We tend to avoid meperidine or Demerol because of some of its side effects like tachycardia, confusion that can result, serotonin syndrome when it's combined with other drugs, but maybe use it in small doses in patients that are shivering in the recovery room. Remifentanil, the brain is more sensitive to remifentanil as well as the other opioids. And again, the recommendation about half the bolus dose. And since the volume of distribution and clearance are decreased, we reduce the infusion rate also by about a third. These are some recommendations for opioids in the older patients. So we've covered over a decade of keywords focusing on cardiovascular physiology, autonomic physiology, respiratory changes, and pharmacologic changes in the elderly. And this quote from C.S. Lewis of, you are never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream, I think is a great one. I hope you have a great day and never stop learning.